Hi, my name is David Keegan. I'm an academic family doctor here at the University of Calgary. Today we're talking about how to present a patient case, the SNAPS method. Now, you might remember uh, previously I've illustrated for you the signpost method. The link to that video is here. This is a more advanced model called the SNAPS method. It was created by Wolpa, Wolpa, and Pap. All right, so this method is really driven again by the learners. Uh, it does, though, get into a bit more detail, and you probably need to have some degree of buy-in from the preceptor on it, but it's still learner-driven. All right, so there are six key steps, and as you might guess, they go along with the name SNAPS, S-N-A-P-P-S. Great. The first one is to summarize. So you give the essential overview of the patient that you as a medical learner or a clinical learner, uh, you give that overview to your preceptor. So let's say it's a patient, uh, it's a woman of childbearing potential age and she's got uh, lower uh, right quadrant pain. So then the way you might summarize it is like, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Smith, I've got this 29 year old lady with right lower quadrant pain uh, of approximately a day's duration. Um, I think it's possible she might have appendicitis, but I think we really have to rule out an ectopic pregnancy. Great, you know, maybe you, the summary could even have been a bit richer depending on your preceptor. Maybe you would have had more detail about, you know, she's tender over her right lower quadrant. I did a uh, pelvic by manual exam and she was tender in her right agnexal region. You know, so you might actually throw some of that in as well, depending again on how big your preceptor wants your summaries to be. Next, you narrow the differential, which you've kind of already done with the summarizing, and, and it's actually okay and kind of easy to flow the two together, uh, but you narrow the differential and you say, you know, based upon her age, her symptoms, uh, her physical findings, I think that there are two main diagnoses that we gotta be worried about here, appendicitis and ectopic pregnancy. You know, it's like, okay, great. Now you analyze. And for Commonwealth spellers, we'll do an S. So you analyze. So that's where you go through things. And, and you as a, the learner might say, so, uh, so this, uh, this all sort of started uh, earlier today with a little bit of right lower um, uh, discomfort. It grew during the day. Interestingly, she hasn't had any anorexia, so she's still actually got a bit of an appetite. She's had no vomiting, she's had no fevers and chills. Um, those things altogether kind of actually seem to argue a little bit against appendicitis, though appendicitis can present in slightly atypical ways. They don't always have to start with periumbilical pain and they don't always have to be accompanied by anorexia but it does make me think that maybe it's more likely to be an ectopic pregnancy. Now on that score, uh, she and her partner have been trying to uh, uh, get pregnant again. Uh, they actually have three other children. Uh, she's been pregnant three previous times, never had any uh, uh, spontaneous or therapeutic abortions, and they've never had any difficulties with fertility. So given that they were trying to get pregnant, she doesn't seem to have the absolutely classical presentation of appendicitis. That's really starting to make me think that this could be an ectopic pregnancy. On physical exam, uh, she doesn't have any upper abdominal tenderness, um, but certainly at a right lower quadrant, she does have uh, tenderness. She is guarding, she's quite uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not really the best at being able to say for sure if there's rebound tenderness or not, because she was just in so much pain. I couldn't really palpate deeply at all. I did do a chaperoned by manual exam, and as I mentioned earlier, yes, she does have some right and axial tenderness, uh, but no cervical motion tenderness. So with all that together, I think both are still possible, but I'm actually thinking it's most likely ectopic. So actually, while I was waiting to see you, we did do a urine pregnancy test on her, and in fact, the beta HCG is positive. So now I'm thinking that, in fact, it's almost definitely that, that this patient has an ectopic pregnancy. The clinical picture fits, and she does have a positive beta HCG. Great, so that's a good, nice analysis. Your preceptor might ask a couple questions to clarify, you know, and, and go on. Um, but the good part is they built in this area called probe. So 
this is a great chance for you as a learner to kind of get some guidance. Say, you know, so I, I was wondering, it's like rebound tenors. If somebody's in a lot of pain and is like preventing you and you can't really examine them, it's kind of like you can't check for a rebound tenderness. Am I wrong there? Is, is that, has that been your experience? You know, that kind of thing. That's a great chance to probe your preceptor about the meanings of some of the clinical symptoms or signs or other features of this patient that you don't know about. And you know, that's the whole point of being here. You're trying to learn. The next step is plan, where you plan the management of the patient. Preceptors generally like it if you have yourself given good thought to this. And so you say, you know, so I was thinking in this scenario, we should consult uh, gynecology immediately. And in the meantime, let's get a stat ultrasound, bedside ultrasound here, or bring her over to the, uh, to the ultrasound unit urgently uh, so that we can confirm if there is actually uh, an ectopic pregnancy in, on her right side. You know, and then you say, but, but before we do that, I want to start uh, some large bore IVs. Her blood pressure has been stable, but she might suddenly start bleeding. So I want to get the, you know, the IVs ready to go so that if we do have to start giving her lots of fluids, uh, we've already got the IVs in place. Okay, that would be a pretty reasonable kind of plan for a learner to suggest. And then finally, you select an issue. You can select it on your own, or you could ask your preceptor if they have thoughts on an area that you should read up on, something like that. But you should always, for every patient, you should always uh, select an issue and read around your own patients. My own doctor who cared for me when I was a kid, uh, Dr. Sims, Douglas Sims, he when, he, when I got into medical school, he was so thrilled, he was happy for me, but he said to me, he said, David, make sure you read around your patients every single day. And at that time, I didn't quite fully understand what he meant, but he's right, he was right. You know, and it was interesting, that, his, that was his one piece about how to be a great doctor and to go through medical school and to learn about my patients and healthcare properly, was reading around the patients every day. So that's the same thing. Either you select or you ask your preceptor, is there an area that you think I should you know, read up more on? Maybe it's about the next stages, you know, or, or watch what you do. You know, what are some of the management options if people can't come and operate on this lady right away or who knows what? There could be all sorts of issues. So there you are, SNAPS. Thanks to the Wolpaws and uh, PAP for creating this model. Uh, this is a nice advanced model. Um, I heard Terry Wolpaw once uh, present about this. Her thinking was that you do a full SNAPS maybe once per half day. So this is not meant to be for every single patient, every single time in great detail, though you can certainly be inspired by it and, and do a sort of more re refined, narrowed down version of it. You certainly can use it. Certainly I've used this many times with my learners in that format. But if, you, if you're gonna do the big, full, robust SNAPS discussion, that does take some time. It's great time. And that was, I think, her guidance as I remember it. Maybe about you know, uh, once per half day or so. All right, thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed the video. Mm -hmm.